exam or anything? Yeah. Yes, the final exam will cover everything uh, that we've talked about in class. Um, will we be getting something similar to last time? No. 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 Yeah. Uh, is it going to be more focused on the newer stuff, or is it going to just be an even distribution? Of that will be up for you to try to figure out of what <laughs> my mindset is. So. This is the game theory part where you need yeah. to think like me about what I do and what I test on. So. Anything else? Oh. All right, let's rock and roll. So, we need, what we're going to look at today is we're going to look, not at this, but on overflows and overwrites. So, how do you declare an array of characters in C? <coughs> yeah, it's, uh, you tell it the type of the, that the array holds, and you also give it the size. And the size. So you do car, bracket, size, and then the variable number, or maybe the other way around. I can never remember exactly which one it is. Um, and what's to stop you from overriding and overriding that buffer? Yeah. It seg faults. It may seg faults. Yeah, so your program crashes, but does it, so it, the fact that it crashes means you must be writing over the end of that buffer, as we'll see. So this is one of the key, and actually if you think about all the software, so what if all software runs on C and C++? That was written in C or C++. Start shouting out things. Maybe I'll throw a, oh, I'll throw a candy in <laughs> I really want to do this, or I want to like throw it all in the air. Anyways, what else? What? Yeah. Minecraft. Minecraft, what else? Uh, does it Isn't run in Java? Java? Yeah, Java. Java. Now, now, now it's yeah. yeah. so oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, what else? Yeah. Uh, like most command line tools. Almost all command line tools. What else? <laughs> Think about software. Most drivers. Drivers, <laughs> which run in the kernel. The operating system itself, so all modern operating systems are written in C or C++. Um, Microsoft Office, Microsoft, uh, basically all of the Office suite, Excel, Word, PowerPoint, those all are running in C or C++. <coughs> so the real key flaw with these with uh, C and C++ is the fact that you can declare an array of a fixed size, but nothing is preventing you, or you have to be careful when you over when you write characters to that buffer that you're writing only the amount of characters that you need. And this is really the cause of so this buffer overflow problem has been known since about the 70s, like the mid 70s. And it's still one of the most exploited uh, and discovered vulnerabilities today with various variations uh, because of this. Um, so these will be, we'll study these there, as we'll see, and the reasons why, they're architecture and operating system dependent. Uh, they can be exploited locally and remotely. And really the core idea is they can modify either or both the data of the application and the control flow of the application. So what do I mean by control flow? Yeah. Yeah, which instructions are executed, right? When you look at some C code and you see that function foo calls function bar, and then after that function returns, function baz is called, right? That's the expected control flow of the application. But if you an attacker can subvert that and make the code execute whatever instructions you want, then you can fundamentally take over this application and make it execute arbitrary code of your choosing. Uh, why is data? So why is being able to modify data important? Yeah. So if there was a path that was hard coded, then you could change that path to have it execute a different path. Yeah, so exactly. So maybe changing paths in the program, maybe there's a variable that's a one or a zero that says if we're admin or we're not. And so if we can change that variable to make us be admin even though we're not, now we've bypassed the authentication of that application. Um, uh, so there's a lot of research in this area, which is very cool, some of which we're doing here at ASU, is uh, automatically identifying and exploiting these buffer overflow techniques. Um, but I won't really have time to talk about that. There, the key takeaway, though, is that this has been a cat and mouse game, kind of as things go on. So attackers find that 
by, as we'll see, exploiting a buffer overflow, they can make the program jump to shellcode on the stack. So the defenders, the people writing software, say, OK, let's make the stack not executable, because you don't ever want to execute that on the stack. So then attackers had to come up with new techniques to still um, get their goals. So the key thing that we're talking about here is the stack. So what is a stack generally? Algorithms, data structures. Yeah, first and last out. So the data structure, actually I have no idea if that's right, let's say yes. Uh, it's a data structure, you push things on, and you pop things off, and it's, yeah, first in. Like, it's right. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so that is the conceptual idea of a stack. What do we mean when we say the stack? Yeah. It's just a pointer, and you keep on incrementing it as you go to different layers. Of the code. What's the purpose of the stack? Why do we need a stack? Yeah. All the processes that get called on get stronger? Uh, close, not process, because a process would have its own different memory space, but function. So think about function calls, right? You have a recursive function call. Every instance of that function call has different local variables, right? So when you have, let's say, you've all done, what's the recursive function you guys have probably done? Like Fibonacci or yeah. something? Yeah. Right, so when you're calculating Fibonacci, you have all of these function calls. Every single instance has different local variables of what Fibonacci number to calculate and what the local variables are. All of that is stored on the stack because you need somewhere to hold that information. Um, so you can think of it as scratch memory for functions and really the stack is what allows us to have recursive function calls uh, because otherwise you wouldn't actually be able to do them. You would not be able to create instances of new calls. Um, almost every single architecture, MIPS, ARMS, x86, x86-64, provide this stack functionality. So it's a general concept to all architectures. Uh, we will, no matter what Jan says, we will start at our stack at high memory addresses and grow down. Um, and just like normal stacks, so what are the stack operations on a data structure stack? Pop and push. Pop and push. So we have the exact same uh, values and actually, x86 assembly language supports stacks natively. Uh, sorry, supports the stack natively, which means that the register ESP holds the address of the top of the stack, which is just some location in memory, and we saw before how that's gonna grow down. And a push instruction, push EAX, this instruction says take the value that's inside EAX, copy it to the stack, and then move the stack pointer down four bytes. This is how you put things into the in and you pop them off exactly the same way. Which means a pop EAX says, take whatever, whatever value is pointed to by the stack pointer and copy that into the EAX register. Pretty easy, simple. Two operations, there's only two operations. This is, it seems complicated, it's not. Well, it's kind of, but you can all get this. So, our stack is going to start, and this is going to, an example that's going to walk you through this. So the stack starts at high memory addresses and goes down to zero, and we'll just kind of conceptually think of this as this stack. So at the start of a program, let's say the program, the stack pointer points to here, one, zero, 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 whatever. It doesn't matter exactly what the value is. So which way is this stack going to grow when we push things onto it? Down. So the stack pointer is going to be going down, and when we pop things off, it's going to be going up. So what does that tell you about the memory that's greater than 10000? Yeah. Yeah, or even just more generally, it's in use, right? That's the way a stack is. So if the stack is growing down, that means you're putting things onto the stack, which means the thing at higher memory addresses is data that's used by the stack, whereas this is garbage. We don't care what those values are. Cool. So garbage on the stack. We're going to look at a super simple example right now of two instructions, push EAX, pop EDP. What's going to happen at the end of that? Semantically. So it's just the same thing, right? It's using a stack. So if you push something onto a stack and pop it off, it's going to be the same thing. 
So this will push whatever's in EAX onto the stack. We'll see that happen. And then we'll see that be copied to EB, uh, EBX. So we have the registers that are important here are EAX. Let's say it has the value hex A. EBX has the value 0. And ESP has the value um, what's that, 10,000 hex. And so we can just walk through and visualize exactly what happens after each instruction. So this is uh, a good tip for if you're trying to understand x86 or any kind of assembly instructions, is to break it down and think about what exactly happens to the CPU and all the registers, essentially, with each of these. So for instance, if this is the next instruction to be executed, right? so this would mean EIP points to whatever that memory location is at, which we'll look at in a second. So it's going to push EAX, which is going to, I believe, first uh, decrement. Yeah, so it's going to decrement and move the stack pointer down and then copy hex A onto that memory location. Everybody OK with that? So we saw the ESP register change. It got decremented because it's moving down. And we've now. And so I guess one thing to notice is that each of these are four offsets. Uh, so this is a word. Yeah, so four bytes, uh, 32 bits there. Just makes it easier to visualize rather than having to think about every individual byte. Now we pop EVP. So what we're going to do is when we execute this instruction, we're going to look up where does ESP point to. It points to this memory location here. Copy whatever those four bytes are and move it into EVX and then increment the stack pointer by four. Cool, so after this is done, which makes sense, right? We did one push and one pop, which means at the end, the stack pointer should be exactly where it was. Uh, a kind of an interesting note, did we clean up this value, OXA, on the stack? But what do we know about that value? It's garbage. It's garbage at this point, right? But it still actually stays there. So uh, a side note that's interesting is, you, if you write a program incorrectly that has passwords, you can actually end up storing passwords on the stack. Ooh. And if you can read out memory, you can like recover passwords and all this stuff. So uh, writing correct programs is difficult. Yeah. Is there any way to like clean up that memory? Though? You have to manually zero it out. So before your function returns, you have to set each of those memory locations, like any sensitive data, to zero. But it doesn't happen automatically by the CPU or the compiler. Okay, so this is just a basic example of how the stack works. Now we need to understand function calls. So to understand that, we're going to look at the concept of function frames. Uh, some of you are currently in 340, so this should be a little bit of an overview, but we'll see how it actually happens on an x86 platform. Um, so functions want to use the stack to essentially allocate space for their variables. And this is why, so when you call a function that has a local variable, and that function returns, how can you reference any of those local variables? Where do they go? Or think about this another way. If you call a function, it calls malloc to create some memory location and then returns a pointer to that memory address, can you still reference that memory location? Yes. What about local variables? Have you ever tried to return the address of a local variable in a function? Yeah, horrible things will happen, as we'll see, because you're pointing into the stack because functions use the stack for their local variables. So all parameters and local variables are stored on the stack. Um, so we'll use the stack pointer. Uh, we'll use the stack for this, but the problem with the stack pointer is um, how many registers were there? in x86, general purpose computing registers. Was it like four or five? I don't know, just the specific answer is not this is not a pop quiz. Uh, it's on the order of four or five. Um, do you ever do any complex mathematical calculations that involve many um, temporary variables? So you take a variable, add one to it, times it by two, multiply it by three, take that value, multiply it by some other complex calculation. In all of this, you still only have five registers to use. So at a certain point, the compiler can't store all the values in registers and need to use the stack. So the stack can change while the function is executing. So rather than use each of the, rather than use the stack pointer to address local variables, which we'll see, 
we use what's called a function pointer. So this function pointer is another register that will see that points at the start of the function frame on the stack. Um, and then the compiler will generate local variables will be different offsets of this frame pointer, and that's what will conceptually get us <coughs> each function that executes its own local variables, and its own copy of local variables, without generating different code per function. All right, we'll walk through an example of this. I think this will clear it up. Uh, in x86, we'll look at EVP. It's a function pointer, base pointer, those are both the same terms for the same thing. So let's look at a C program. So we have int main. We have three local variables, a, b, and c. a and b are ints, c is a float. And then we are going to set a equal to 10, b equal to 100, c equals to 10.4, a equals to a plus b, and then return zero. So complicated program? Yeah. No. So what the, what the compiler needs to do when it generates the x86 code is it needs to say, when I say something like set A equal to zero, what does that actually mean? What do I set to be zero, right? I can't necessarily set a register uh, because if I call another function, it may reuse that register and mess things up. So it needs to come up with offsets for all of these local variables from the frame pointer. So what it'll do is it'll say um, A is at some offset EVP plus A. It will just decide. And it will say B is at some offset EVP plus B. And C is at some offset EVP plus C. That way, these memory operations that we saw in the C code are easily translated. Well, we'll say, well, the, and this is in high pseudocode. We'll look at the x86 instructions. The memory at location EVP plus A is equal to 10. That's just a direct translation of the line on the left to the right. So what would be the second line? Yeah, so the memory of EBP plus B equals 100, and we'll have the memory of EBP plus C is equal to 10.45. What about the next one? What do we have to do? Yeah. So mem of EBP plus A equals mem of EBP plus A plus mem of EBP plus B. Perfect. Exactly. See? So, and then the return stuff, which we won't get into too much right now. Um, and so it just decides. So it decides on these offsets. We'll see why, but it uses negative values as offsets from the base pointer. So it'll say, OK, A is at EVP minus C. And B is at EVP minus A. So it doesn't actually matter which one of those values, because these are just local memory addresses, as long as they're not overlapping. right? Because then you would get weirdness happening with your variables. Uh, how big are these variables? Four bytes, A, B, and C, all those are four bytes. <coughs> and it will say C is at EBP minus four. So it just happened to be how it did it, minus four, minus eight, minus C. And this is from a real example where I compiled this and looked at the assembly instructions. And actually, the weird thing is, depending on your compiler version, it'll generate different and uh, more optimized code. So um, we'll skip this part for now. But essentially, the instructions that we'll see is move hex A into EDP minus C, which is exactly this operation, which is exactly this A equals 10. So it's setting the memory location at EDP minus C to 10. That's what that instruction does. And the next instruction, let's move 100 into EDP minus 8. And we know EVP minus 8 is at B because that's just what the compiler decided. And finally, we get a slightly more complicated one where we move 41273333 into EAX. What's this value? 10.45. Was it? 10.45. It doesn't look like 10.45 to me. What is it? It's in that it's in a weird thing. Triple e. Yes, I triple floating point value representation of 10.45. So yeah, it's. Probably not super precise. I actually don't know exactly what it translates to. So we move that into EAX, but we haven't stored it into memory yet. We need to move EAX into EVP minus 4, which is the variable C. Uh, fun fact, if you look into this, this is because this, uh, this constant value is bigger 
like you can't do this because of the size of the instructions of a move instruction. So I need to move it first into a register and then move that register. The compilers know this and figures all that stuff out, so you don't have to. So now we've done <coughs> everything here, these three instructions, and then we'll look at this last one and we'll move EBP minus eight into EAX. What's EBP minus eight? What variable? B. So we're gonna move B into EAX. We're gonna add whatever's in EAX into EBP minus C, which is which value? A, and store that in A. So we just did B plus A into A. So that's this A is equal to A plus B, and then other stuff. Cool? So how much, if you look at this, how much space does the compiler need in this function main's function frame? Yeah. Uh, 12 bytes? At least 12 bytes, right? Four for each of the local variables. Um, so we'll see how this function frame actually looks. Uh, what we will do is go over this exact instruction with uh, in a little stack. Again, we'll start our stack at hex 1000. And here, actually the only registers that matter are ESP, EAX, ESP, and EBP. So how, so when every function is called, it doesn't know who called it. Right? It could have been called from anywhere. All it knows, what does the function know about when it's called? conceptually when you write a function. Yeah. It has, if there are any arguments, it has those. Arguments, it has those arguments to that specific invocation of a function, but you don't actually know where you came from, right? Otherwise, that would make programming incredibly weird. If you had to think about context of who's calling you and when, when you're debugging, you have to think about those things, which makes it very difficult, right? Uh, so if we walk through this and we say the stack pointer is at 10,000 hex, the first thing that's going to happen, and so this base pointer is whatever base pointer was of whoever called us. So we don't actually know what that value is. But what we're going to do is set the current base pointer to where the stack is. So that's this next instruction is move the stack pointer into the base pointer. Now they're both pointing at hex 10,000. And now we're going to make space for our local variables by moving the stack pointer down, in this case 16 bytes for a hex 10. So that happens, but the frame pointer stays at hex 1000, and this way throughout this execution, all of the offsets here will be for all of our variables constant, no matter what happens to our stack pointer if the stack moves around. Does that make sense? Wait, you first move the stack pointer to the base pointer yeah. first, or? We're setting up our base pointer. So our the person who called us has their own base pointer. Uh, if you think about this very carefully, you'll think you'll realize this means that whoever called us needs to save their base pointer onto the stack uh, because we're clearly going to overwrite it. And then we move the base, the stack pointer down by however much the compiler decided. In this case, it decided 16 bytes. It doesn't actually need all that space. It just that's what it decided. Uh, so for you first move the stack pointer to where the base pointer is, right? Yes. Oh, okay. Flip it around. We move the content of the stack pointer into the base pointer. That was the very first thing we did. So that now the base pointer points to the same location as the stack pointer. So now we do, do our computation exactly as we saw. So we move hex A into EBP minus C. So we have all of our values here. The CPU will calculate EBP minus C to that FFF4 and copy hex A onto there, those four bytes. Then it will move EDP minus eight, which is FFF eight, <coughs> onto hex 64. And then now we have our two-step process where it's gonna move this 10.45 and IEEE floating point into EAX, and then moving EAX into EDP minus four. <coughs> now we actually do the computation, and what was the original computation in the C code? A is equal to A plus B, exactly. So we know that when that's done, A, which is here, should be A plus 64 in there. So it should be 110, since it's 110. Whatever that is in hex, I have no idea. We'll find out. 
So we'll move EVP minus 8, just EVP 4, 8, 64 into EAX. We see the EAX value change. And then we will add EAX to EVP minus C. EVP minus C is here, the A variable, and it will get the value of 6E. So this means every single function basically needs to have, it's called a preamble here. Uh, every single function needs to set up its own frame pointer. Because this way, if this function calls itself, a new frame, a new uh, function frame will be added to the stack. And that will keep going as long as that program is executing and calling functions. <coughs> and then when functions return, the stack moves up. And then it goes down as other functions are called. Questions? more important conceptually to understand what's going on here because we're going to add in return addresses and how a function like the CPU actually executes things. <coughs> cool. Okay, so uh, I will skip this, but basically um, when we think about it, when we call a function, and we just talked about this, so when you call a function, what do you provide to that function conceptually? The argument. Arguments. So if we provide the arguments to that function, what are we expecting in returns? Yeah. Some value. The return value, right? And we're expecting, when we think about the CPU level, that it doesn't mess up our function frame, right? We don't expect that we, we call a function and it changed our local variable unless we passed in a pointer to a local variable and then that function could change that data. Um, so we need the return value, the parameters. We also, as we saw, the function that we call is going to mess up our frame pointer. It's going to overwrite it as the very first thing it does is it moves our it's the it moves the stack pointer into the frame pointer, which gets rid of ours. Which means that when control flow returns to our program, now we don't have a frame pointer. We're pointing down somewhere. So we need to actually save our frame pointer. And then and this is key and what becomes key when we talk about exploitation and buffer overflows. Now what else do we need to know? So does a CPU, like, how does a CPU work? Like, how does it know what instruction to execute next? Yes. There's a program counter that keeps track. It has a program counter that keeps track of the next memory address to, to execute those instructions from. That's all it does. Very stupid. How do you change that program counter? Uh, depending on the architecture, you may override the register. When you think about it in terms of instructions, how do you do that? How do you know what value? Return. Possibly a return. We'll talk about that in a second, but I want to think of like branches. Usually it automatically increments it. So it will automatically increment it. Yeah, it'll just keep going and executing forever. What if you have an if statement? Yeah, so a branch or a jump instruction tells depending on this condition, then change the program counter. Or an unconditional jump just says change the program counter to this location. So it will just keep executing. So then, OK, so think we're executing, let's say, the main function. We'll ignore how we got there. But we're executing the main function. Now we call a function foo. Right? We set it up. We call that function. We store all these things. And now foo's done executing. How does it know to go back to main? Yeah, so fundamentally, it must store where it should go back to, right? There's nothing, the CPU itself doesn't have any support for, oh, go back to that last function that called you, like whoever called you, because when you write a function foo, you can call it from many places in your program, right? And you wouldn't think that you call a function foo in main and then it jumps to bar. And this changes that runtime. So we need to, and this is called the return address. So we need to have a way to store where do we go executing after this program has stopped execution. And this is going to be key because this is, you can think of it, uh, okay, good, I'm at undergrads. You can think of it like the story of Hansel and Gretel. Everyone heard that story? Oh, yeah. Like little kids who like leave breadcrumbs to go into the forest. And why do they do that? So they can 
find their way back at night. They follow the breadcrumbs and it leads them back to where they want to go. This is exactly the same thing. This return address, as we'll see, <coughs> is information on the stack that tells the CPU where to go next because it's just going and executing. And it says, oh, this function is done. Where do I go? Oh, there we go. This is where I go. And I start executing, and then this is where I go. So just like if you were an evil witch and you could change that uh, breadcrumb path to go wherever you wanted it to go, a dumb child like a CPU will just do it, right? <coughs> I mean, in the sense that a CPU doesn't think or have logic, it just does whatever it's supposed to do. Um, so we need some kind of convention about how to do this. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but Linux for x86 uses this cdecl calling convention of exactly how you call a function. So first the caller pushes all the arguments onto the stack in right to left order, and then pushes the address of the instruction after the call. So this is the breadcrumb of where to go back. And the callee pushes uh, the previous frame pointer onto the stack. Interesting. All right. Create space on a stack for local variables. Ensure that the stack is consistent. Oh, I guess I lied. We'll see this in an example. Okay. So to walk through an example, we have a function main has a value a. Uh, it says a is equal to call e 1040 return a. Call e is a simple function that takes in two integer parameters, returns a plus b plus one. Have y'all written code like this? Functionally, the same thing, you can call functions. Um, so when the compiler compiles this code, in main, it's going to first have to save whoever called it's base pointer. So I lied a little bit, but that program, uh, that does that. So it saves the base pointer, moves the stack pointer into the base pointer, subtracts uh, 18 hex from the stack pointer to make room for main. Why it needs, uh, yeah, it's kind of a tricky thing. We'll go over this a little bit. But fundamentally, it's going to move the value 28 onto ESP plus 4, so there's no minus there, so it's an ESP plus 4. Move A onto ESP, then call call E. And as we'll see, this call instruction is the key here, because a call instruction says jump to this memory address and push the return address onto the stack. <coughs> then move uh, EAX, so in uh, the CDECL calling convention, once you call a function, the value that's in EAX is your return value. So EAX is going to move into EVP minus 4, which is the local variable A, and then it's going to move EVP minus 4 into EAX and then leave and return. Uh, so we'll ignore leave for now. For now, it cleans up the stack, and then the return instruction will go back to whoever called main. So we're doing a return A. So we just put the value of A inside the EAX register, return, so that whoever called us can get the return value of this function thing. So call E has the same thing. So call E, so this is uh, the prologue and the epilogue. So these are going to be mostly the same. You'll see these in almost every function you look at, because they all need to do this kind of bookkeeping in order to do what they're supposed to do. Uh, whereas call E pushes EVP, moves the stack pointer into EVP, moves EVP plus C. So why is it a plus C instead of a minus C? What did we look at? What was like EVP minus C in our other example? Yeah. It's like going down, right? So like yeah, it's going down. What was that like uh, in the program? Minus C was like access variable. Local variables, exactly. So if we're going up, <coughs> it's our parameters. So these are the parameters that are passed into our function. We'll see exactly how that works. Move EVP plus 8 into EDX. This is basically an add them together plus 1, uh, or add them together and then add 1 and then pop EVP and return. So again, prologue, epilogue. And now we will watch this in action as this actually happens. Um, so here I actually trace each of these memory offsets of where one compilation of this put all of these addresses. This is because in a sense, like when the program is actually executing, we're not going to call some simple call e. We're going to call an actual memory location that we're going to go execute at. So this doesn't have to be in this exact order. Uh, interesting thing here, if you start looking at the deltas here, that will tell you the size of each of these instructions, which is kind of cool. Uh, so you can see the push EVP is one byte. I don't know. I like that stuff. So. 
Now we're going to go through everything. So this is basically simulating a C, an x86 CPU in um, what is this PowerPoint. So the registers that are used here, EAX, EDX, ESP, EBP, and EIP. So that's the only things we care about here. So the stack will be at some value. One time that I ran this, it was at FD2D4. Uh, and you can do this by just uh, setting a breakpoint on main and GDB, running the program, and seeing what the memory locations are. This is how I got all these inf this information. <coughs> so main starts executing. Does main know who called it? No, there's actually is usually another function that calls main with libc and setting up all the dynamic libraries, but for our intents and purposes, we don't care. We just know that somebody must have called us, so we have to do all of our bookkeeping. We need to save their base pointer by pushing EBP. And so we'll push EBP. We will then set up our frame pointer by moving the current stack pointer into the base pointer. So now the base pointer, instead of pointing to our caller's function frame, will point to ours. We will subtract 18 hex from ESP to set up our local variables. Well, not just our local variables, but to set up the call to this function. So we will then, and remember the call here was um, A equals callee 1040. So we're going to move hex 28 to ESP plus 4 going to be here. So hex 28 is here. Which which of those values, which of the parameters is it? What were the parameters? A and B. Oh, I can't both go back that far. All right, we're too far gone. There are 10 and 40. So this is the second parameter. And then the next one is A, which is the first parameter. So again, going back to that calling convention, essentially we did the effect of pushing onto the stack the arguments from right to left. So this is the rightmost argument was hex 28, and then the, the next argument is 10. Or if you read it going up, the very first one is the first argument, second, third, fourth, whatever. So this is how that function that we call knows how to access those variables. Now, important, what is this call instruction going to do? semantically here. So if we think at the end of this call instruction, so what's going to happen to this CPU state? Yeah, It's going to redirect the instruction pointer to the callee like, function. To there. this, exactly. So it's not yeah. the callee function anymore, but it's uh, 804.83.94. And then it's also going to save the return. What's the return value? The current memory address of the call function. <coughs> The next one, yeah. So it figures out the next instruction. So it will save on. It'll basically do a push 80483bf that value onto the stack. And so that's a two-part process. <coughs> so it decrements the stack. It it copies the stack 80483bf, and then it starts executing. It changes the instruction pointer to be 8048394. Now at this point, does callee know who called it? No, right? It has absolutely no idea, which makes sense with how you're used to writing functions. You don't care who called you, you just do your job in return. So here we do have to do the same thing. We push EDP. We move the stack pointer to the base pointer. So now we've saved main's base pointer on the stack, which means we can use it. So we're going to use it. Um, now if we look at this, we can basically see that all of this memory belongs to main, and all of this memory belongs to callee. So you have this as the base pointer. So you have EBP uh, plus 8 is the first argument, and EBP plus 12 is the second argument, and that's the same for whatever function, no matter what. <coughs> so we'll move EBP plus C, which is 28, into EAX. We'll move EBP plus 8 into EDX, which is A. We will add those two together into EAX, and we will add 1 to EAX. So this should be the value of uh, 51, so 10 plus 40 plus 1. Now we, will, now we have to return. So we need to undo everything we did in the epilogue for calling. So we need to restore the base pointer of main. So we're going to pop EBP, which is going to set the base pointer register 
base pointer register, which is up there. How do we know that this is actually main's base pointer? We don't. Who said that? Good. We don't. Why not? Yeah, if you think about it right here, when we do pop EVP, all that we're doing, so the stack pointer is here, we take whatever that memory look, whatever's at that memory location, and we put it in the base pointer. We don't know that, there's no check to verify that what we saved at the start is what is put back. Similar, now we'll look at a return statement where we're going to return, which essentially you can think of as a pop EIP. So this means take wherever we're looking at here, copy 80483BF into the instruction pointer, and then start executing from there. So return will change that to BF. And again, how did this return instruction know to return here? It was told by memory on the stack, right? It's just that at that very specific memory location on the stack is where call E will return to. There's nothing in here that we saw that verified that that's actually the function that called call E. So then we'll do our cleanup. I'm going to skip this. You can go over this. Ba ba ba. A leave is uh, fancy. And then a return. And where are we going to return to now? Whoever called main, right? They'll be a, they were uh, right above at FD2D4. We can't see it, but there's some instruction that called us, and we'll return right after that. Questions on that? So when it pops EVP uh, at, in call we, does it wake, uh, go to that, um, does the, like the base pointer uh, goes up here, right, or something? So when it pops EVP, it just copies whatever is currently on the stack pointer and copies that value into EVP. So it doesn't actually know anything about that value. Um, but I need to keep trucking. Cool. And so now, so if we said that, let's say this, uh, Let's say, where's the, yeah, okay, here. So let's say we have some buffer on the stack that's our local variable. So we have a local variable that's a character array of 50 characters here. Let's say, let's imagine this being down 50 characters. So what would happen if we wrote 58 characters? So we have here, 50 characters down. What's at the 50th or 51st character? this FD2B0. So we'll overwrite one of these bytes, and then the next one will overwrite the next one, and the next one will overwrite the next one, and the next one will overwrite the next one. I think because the ending of this, it'll actually be a 0F, but that's OK. You'll, you'll find that out. Then the next four bytes will be these four bytes. So this is the core idea of a buffer overflow, is once we can overwrite a buffer onto the stack, we can change these stored values specifically will be um, will be interested in overriding this um, saved return address, and then that way, when the program returns, it just returns to whatever was there. <coughs> so this is the core idea, and as we'll see, we can actually um, we can maybe jump to user-defined code, or so we may be able to jump to other functions in the program. So we may be able to redirect the control flow to, let's say there was a function that said make me an admin, you could redirect to there and that would be great. Or, as we'll see, we can redirect it onto the stack which we have our code in. So we can have it start executing code of our choosing. And if your stack is executable, then the CPU will just do that. It has no idea it's moved to the stack 
things. It's just memories and bytes. So let's look at an example of this, of how this would crash. So we have a super simple example. We have a function my copy that's doing string copy from string the parameter onto foo. What are the semantics of string copy? Like it, the string you want to copy into first, followed by yep. the string you want to uh, copy. So the destination, the source. So how does it know how many bytes to copy? It goes until the terminator. It goes until the terminator. So it uh, it goes until a null byte. So it takes the first byte of string, says if it's not zero, copied into foo. It looks at the next byte of string and copies it to foo plus one and so on and so forth until all of the characters of string are copied. So we can do something. You can see I made these slides a long time ago. Um, and we can see what's the size of this array. Four. It's still a character pointer that we're passing in to string copy, which is totally fine. But string copy doesn't know that the destination is only four characters. Right? It has absolutely no way of knowing it. All it is is a pointer to some memory location. So fundamentally, if we control that copy to string, we can do whatever we want. So if we look at this, uh, main will be doing all these things. It will then move a memory address, which is a pointer to that string, onto the stack pointer. It will call my copy. It will then <coughs> call printf, and it will leave. Uh, whereas my copy pushes EBP, moves the stack pointer to the base pointer, subtracts 28 from the stack pointer, uh, sets everything up, calls string copy, leaves, and returns. So now let's step through and see what actually happens here. So we have all that code, same thing we looked at before. We'll go a little bit quicker this time to get to kind of the, the good bits. Um, but you can, I encourage you to step through this with the code and you can look at this and see the actual instructions um, happen. So we're gonna push, do the epilogue, create our stack pointer. We're going to move 804, 8504 onto the stack pointer. And then we're going to call my copy. And remember, the call instruction will push this 804, 8423 onto the stack. And this is the next instruction to be executed after my copy. So now we'll push EBP, move that, create our stack pointer, move uh, What's this? Uh, oh yeah, move our parameter. So move uh, 804, 8504, which is our string into <coughs> EAX. Move that onto the stack plus four. Uh, get this next instruction. What's this? EVP minus C. So this is, again, so now we're gonna call string copy. And we can read this as, this is the first argument and the second argument. So the first argument is gonna be where we will copy the string and the destination, and the second one will be the source. So we're going to read one byte from this string and copy it onto FD2AC, which is here, right? So how big was the um, how big was the character array in our C code? Four. Four. If we want to change and overwrite the saved instruction pointer, so where's the saved instruction pointer on here? The last two bytes. Save return value of whoever called us. So if we want to overwrite that, we actually have to overwrite not just four characters, we have to overwrite all the way from FD2AC to FD2BC and then four more bytes. Is that greater than four? Yes. Yes. Why? Because the compiler just decided to do that. The compiler decided it needed uh, 28 hex characters or 28 hex bytes for this function frame. So this is why it's always important uh, when you're doing this kind of analysis to look at the actual binary rather than just looking at the C code and what the C code tells you to do. All right, so now we have our copy function. And so what's gonna happen? So again, we'll, we know that that's our constant string, 804, 8504. 
It's ASU space CSE space 340 fall 2015 rocks. And so what string copy is going to do is copy a byte at a time, <coughs> starting at FD2AC, which is this pointer. One, two, three, four. This is ASU space. And then uh, CSE space. Uh, because it's, and this is where you can see the ending. So 61, 73, 75, 20. So it's writing it in reverse order back. Does that make sense? So 61 is A, 73 is S, 75 is U, and 20 is space. Because it's writing a byte at a time. But if you look at it like this, you see the byte values are, like as a 32 bit number, are reversed than what you expect because of the endianness. And this is why that comes in. And it'll just keep going. And again, like we've already at this point overwritten data that we shouldn't have. Right? That buffer was only f size 4, but now we've overwritten at least 8 bytes, but we keep going because string copy has no conception of the size of this buffer. So we'll keep going, keep going, keep uh, going, keep going. Is it going to crash? Not yet. Not yet? Why not yet? Um, yeah, we haven't written to any, right? A seg fault happens when we overwrite memory that we don't own. But this is the stack, right? We own all this memory. We can write to every memory address on the stack or to, up to some extent. If we got all the way up, we would cause a seg fault. But this just returns, and string copy is happy. It did its job. It copied bytes from the source to the destination. It's like, I did just like, this is the curse of computers, which hopefully you're, well, not hopefully, but you're definitely learning. They do exactly what you tell them to do and nothing more, right? So string copy copies bytes from the source to the destination. That's it. So then we do a leave, and the leave instruction, as we'll see, will change our base pointer to be 67, 67, 61, 66, which is at the place where we overwrote the saved base pointer. Is it going to crash? Not yet. Not yet. Why not yet? I haven't tried to access it. Yeah, it would, it would crash if we tried to dereference this memory location, right? If we tried to access the memory that was at that location, because it likely doesn't exist. Now it will return, and now what's going to happen? It'll crash. Well, it'll, yeah. It will try to access that memory, and depending on what it is, it will crash. It yeah, it's going to try to basically, so it's going to be, again, return is like a pop EIP. It's going to start trying to execute memory at location 31, 30, 32, 20. So it'll do that, and it will then get a seg fault. So if you run this, uh, this was on one of my examples. You can run it, uh, and you can actually, if you want to do this, you can take that example, do these exact commands to do this yourself. Um, if we do a dot out, it will say segmentation fault core dump, and then we can run GDB on it, run it, start it, and see that it actually gets a seg fault because it's trying to access memory 3130, 3220 exactly that memory we copied over in the return value of my copy. Now what <coughs> can we control where this string where this code goes? Yes. So why? Yeah. How? We were the one that gave it the input so we could give it like a different uh, input that would cause the did, did you give this this input? Well oh I guess not. Yeah, so it's a hard-coded example, right? Which doesn't really make sense. So we're not, we can't change this string without recompiling the program. And like we said for local attacks, if you can change the code, you've already won, right? So, uh, but this is an example. And if we, oh, the cool thing is if you look into info registers in GDB, you would see all the values. So we'd see the base pointer has exactly what we thought it would. And the, um, when we get down to EIP, it has that value that we do not want. <coughs> so if this was our user input, so what are some ways that we can give input to a program, a C program? Yeah. Command line parameters. Command line parameters. How does that show up here? Arg C, arg B. Arg C and arg B. Yeah. So if this was a my copy with arg B one, then you could just put different command line arguments to different size until you crash it. <coughs> what else? 
Standard input, yeah. So standard input, if they're reading, uh, get is one of the classic overflow functions. Um, get string copy or string cat, uh, s printf, s scanf, and any custom uh, input routines. So the key is how do we actually exploit this? Uh, there's a super famous paper that I highly recommend if you're interested in this to read. It's called Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. Oh, no, I don't have the date uh, the year that was published. Um, it's still a good article for understanding stack-based exploitations. Um, so what we want to do is we, so let's say we can control this instruction pointer. The question is, where do we go? Right. What do we want to get out of this program? What do we want it to execute? Yeah. Like you said, we could want it to execute like a function that would make us admin. Yeah, a function that makes you admin. Or maybe you'd want to execute like a bin sh. So to get a command shell with the privileges of that, that system. So that's kind of our standard goal. Uh, the tr traditional way of doing this is called shell code. So the idea is you write some custom code that gets written onto the stack, the program executes that, and then you have it jump onto the stack to do that. Um, now, the problem is that on modern binaries, you have address space layout randomization, which means every time you run the application, the stack is at a different location. And because your input is being copied onto the stack and overriding that return address, you don't, you can't predict where that value is going to be. Um, in addition, they've now done things where you can't actually execute the stack. You can only, the stack is non-executable. So if you tried to jump onto the stack, the CPU throws an exception because you're not allowed, just like writing to memory that's read only, uh, the CPU actually enforces that. So then basically, Modern exploitation uses this concept of return-oriented programming, uh, which we'll look at very quickly. Um, there's a, yeah, it has a whole, basically, we're going to use little snippets of the program itself and reuse tiny bits of code to change registers and do whatever we want. Um, so this was, there's a really good paper, uh, The Geometry of Innocent Flesh on the Bones. And we'll look again at a very simple program. So now this is a vulnerable program that you could compile and play with. Uh, string copy, argv1, onto foo. Right? Is this any different from the previous example we saw? No, not really. And if we look at main, it looks essentially the same. I mean, these instructions are basically the same. So to follow along back home, uh, there are some, you need to disable certain uh, features, but if you do this instruction, you will be able to compile a binary that does this. And so <coughs> we want to essentially, if we went back to when we talked about system calls, what we want to do is call exec ve with slash bin sh is our goal. So that's kind of our end goal of what we want. So how did we do that? Well, we needed to get the value b into eax. And we need to get the address of a string bin sh into ebx. And we need to get, well, an ecx. So if, when we call exec ve, uh, this is the number. This is the program we want to execute. This is our v of this example. And then the next uh, edx is going to be the environment pointer. So we can put null in there. So that's our goal that we want. And we can, so uh, we need to somehow write memory to this application. We can't necessarily write it, well, maybe we can write it on the stack, but <coughs> we can look at the binary, and this is a modern compiled binary, and we can see what memory locations in here are at fixed locations, like locations that I know are not going to change, and all these addresses are not going to change. The, uh, the stack will change, which I'm not sure where it is here um, off the top of my head. We can look and we see, man, this is awesome, there's a dot data section that is writable, and I know starts at 080EA060. So what we need is we need a little snippet of code that will do one thing for us and, re and return. 
Because on a buffer overflow, we basically control the stack. So just like I mentioned, like the breadcrumbs, essentially we're going to set up a series of breadcrumbs hopping around the program itself in order to do arbitrary computation. So if you do this example, there'll be a similar gadget, which will move EAX into EDX, wherever EDX points to and return. So the gadget, this is a tiny gadget, and we can control what where it returns to, so we can control the next function that gets, or the next snippet of code that gets <coughs> called. Um, so if we have EAX be the, the string slash BIN, and we can have EBX be the address of dot data, which we saw was 080EA060, if we get the program to execute this, it will copy slash bin to that location. Everyone agree with that? Assume we can do that. But what do we need? Like, what's our requirement to be able to use this? Yeah. We need bin in EAX. Yes, yeah, so we need bin in EAX. So we need to be able to put our data into EAX. And what about EBX? Same thing, right? We need to be able to control the the value of the EBX register. So we need more gadgets. We need to go gadget hunting some more. Uh, there are nice tools to help you do this, but I kind of want to walk us through an uh, example of this. And this is not to say that you absolutely have to do this, but this is showing kind of modern exploitation techniques that you can get into a lot. So we need to get our data into EDX. Turns out there's a super nice gadget that pops something on the stack into EDX and then returns. So assuming we control the content of the stack, and do we? Yes, because we're overriding and controlling the content of that stack. So because we can do that, whatever we put on the stack at wherever this is going to be pointing to, it will pop that value off into EDX, and then return to whatever's at the memory location after this value that we wanted in EDX. Cool, so that helps us a lot. We need, wait, where's the EAX? Oh no. Oh no, we need another gadget. Okay, let's assume we have found an EAX gadget. Oh, this is just an example. Okay, cool. So we can actually, <coughs> so by looking at the program <coughs> when I did this, so there's 50 A's to get up to the base pointer, so that gets us up to the current frame pointer. The next four bytes is the save EVP, so just four bytes of something or whatever, and then we have, so we want the value 08061A. And then we have something else, EBCD. So if we break point right after this string copy, we can see that we had 50 A's copied from the buffer to up to BFFF688. And then the next four bytes are ABCD, which was our value for that. And then we have 0806E91A. <coughs> so now it's going to, and this was that value we wanted to eventually go into ED, uh, sorry, this was the location of the gadget that popped something into EBX. So if we look at this, it's going to do, uh, it's going to do the leave and then finally the return. And so this now is going to execute that gadget that we have of pop EDX and then return. So what value is going to be in EDX when this next instruction finishes? Six, six, two, six, three, six, four, six, yeah, 626364, 65. Who put that data there? We did. we did. I did, right? And if we go back, we can see that that data is here. This is EDCB. So if we go back, Now, so we can control the value that's now in EDX. So we can put in EDX 62, 63, 64, 65. We can change that to the address of data. And now, what's the next thing that's going to execute? Where is this control flow going to go? Yeah. Yeah, 
whatever's here. So there's a zero here because of the last byte of our string copy. So we copied all of our data plus a zero, and that's why there's a null byte there. But fundamentally, if we added four more bytes, we would control that value, which means wherever this goes, we can then control where that returns to. <coughs> now we need a gadget for the EAX register. So there's, we look for more gadgets. We'll see that there's a pop EAX return at this memory location. There's a pop EBX return at this location, pop ECX return, an XOR EAX EAX return. Why is this useful? Yeah. Zero's EAX. Yeah, it sets EAX to zero, which can be nice, <laughs> uh, depending on what we need to do. Or actually, what do we need? What's our goal for the value of, or I guess I will rephrase this. Um, the goal is the value inside the EAX. We want to be, I believe, B, because we want to, uh, we want to call system call exec VE. So if we reset it to zero, then if we can increment it with this gadget, to do this 11 times, we'll then finally get a system call, and we'll know that there's a system call, and which is an 80 at this memory location. So the super cool thing is, all of this code already exists inside the binary. We're simply changing the control flow to do all of these little tiny things that put together will actually allow us to have arbitrary computation. And call, in this case, bin sh. So now we can build our shell code. So I will, uh, we'll write a Python script. Uh, this is kind of what I meant. When, this is more of a, a tip than this is. So we'll, uh, are we using phone tools here? I guess not, but that's fine. So we're first gonna send 50 A's and then B, C, D, E. So B, C, D, E is the state base pointer. Then we will put the address 0806E91A. Uh, the nice thing is about this pack uh, command is that it will do the endianness for us so we don't have to worry about that, which is nice. Then we'll put the address of dot data. And then, so this will, after this executes, right, we're writing up the stack. This will move this value, 080EA060, into EBX. So now we have address of dot data into EAX. Now we need to control EAX. We need slash BIN slash, or slash BIN, sorry. So now this gadget will pop EAX, so it'll pop the next value, which is slash bin, into EAX. So now we're at the point where EAX register has slash bin, EDX has the address of dot data, and now we need that gadget to move EAX to wherever EDX points to. So we do that, and now at this point we've now, so we've copied slash bin to dot data. Now we need to copy, so now we have a problem, we need to copy slash slash sh, why do we need to do that? We need four bytes. Yeah, we're going to copy. All these copy and move instructions are four bytes. And on Unix, if you add as many slashes as you want, it doesn't matter. So that's a little trick that we use here. So we do exactly the same thing. The only thing, well, two things are different. One, do we want to copy this to address of dot data? No, because there's already four bytes there of slash bin. We want to do address of dot data plus four. And we're controlling this, so we, so that's the uh, the gadget, and then we have the address of data plus four. So this is sixty four. That's sixty. Then we call we do our pop ex gadget. We do slash slash sh, and then we do our gadget again to move eax into ebx. Now we finally have the string slash bin slash slash sh into memory. <coughs> we have a problem though because our string needs to be null terminated slash bin slash slash sh, and we don't know what's after that. So again, we need to zero out address of data plus eight. We do pop edx return, and we're going to put the address of dot data plus eight. We're going to xor eax. We're going to move eax into edx, and now that string is zeroed out. 
So then we'll finish it up. So now we have a null terminated string, B-I-N-S-H, at 080E-A060. Now we need to build up the argv vector, so we have to do a little bit more stuff, but uh, we'll use the address of plus 10 to do the argv vector. It depends on the architecture whether you absolutely have to do this, of uh, sending an argv vector to bin sh. Um, I like to do it because I've not done it once and it was a huge pain. Uh, so this is a slightly more complicated, but we're setting up a pointer at data plus 12. The first thing there is a pointer to address of data. So that's an argv vector. So now we have character arrays of arrays. So now we have the first one as a pointer to argv uh, to slash bin sh. And now we need to zero that out because that's the semantics of argv. Same things. And now we have everything. So now we need to call exec ve address of dot data, address of data plus 12, and the address of data plus 8. And so the idea is we're reusing the null bytes that are already there at the address of data plus 8 for the environment parameter. So this is uh, pretty simple. We uh, use our gadgets. We then set up edx. And now we do eax as 11. We don't do anything fancy. Uh, we zero out eax register. And then we just increment it 11 times. Wow, the PowerPoint is slow. And then call in 80. And now no matter where the stack is, we actually don't care at all where the stack is because dot data section is constant and our text section where we're using all these addresses for is constant. So I can run this with my Python script. Oh, I can first set a breakpoint at 8048E67, which is right before this return instruction. So I'll see this like insanity of this stack, right? Because I've written over a bunch of bytes of the stack. <coughs> and if you step through this, I can't believe I actually did this, but um, you can step through each of these gadgets, right? So even though this looks contiguous, right? All of these memory locations are different memory locations, right? So everything that's a ret is different memory locations. And so it's just gonna, the CPU is gonna go through uh, pop EDX, return, pop EAX, return, move EAX into EDX, continuing to do that through these gadgets just as we laid out until finally, let's see, before I get to the int 80, okay, yeah, now you have a bunch of increments, which I didn't want to do, so now you have the case where right at int 80, you have V in EAX, which is exact VE. You have 080EA060, which is the string slash VIN slash slash SH. You have the argv vector, which is at EAX plus 12. And then you have EAX, which is at uh, address of data plus 8. You have all this set up. You call in 80, and the operating system says, great, I will like, execute slash uh, bin SH for you because you asked so nicely. So if you set a breakpoint there, you can look in GDB, examine this memory location as a string, and it would tell you that there's a string slash bin slash slash sh there. You could look at 2 uh, at 80c, which is the second argument, and you'd see that there is just like an argv vector. The very first one points to the argv0 of the program, and the second one is the null terminated vector. So there's only one argument to this argv. So it's like executing bin sh with no arguments. At 68, we know there's zero. And so if you continue, it would say process is executing a new program, bin dash, which is the equivalent of calling exec ba ve with slash bin slash slash sh, uh, which is a fully ASLR proof ROP payload. ASLR? Uh, address space layout randomization. So it means that no matter where the stack is, uh, we don't care because we only use the fixed values of the text, the code, and the dot data segment. Um, so you should be not do this yourself by hand. It's a huge pain. I've done it a few times. Uh, there are automated tools to find gadgets. Uh, Pro Tools is a super comprehensive library that's used by most of the top CTF teams, Capital Flag teams. Um, it's a really cool library to start playing with. It allows you to build like 
uh, an exploit script that interacts with a remote application or a local application using the same thing. Um, it actually is all types of complicated that I don't even understand all the features. Uh, there's tools Rop Gadget and Ropper, which will analyze a binary and show you interesting gadgets, and some of them will even automatically create that Rop chain for you in a Python script. Yeah, Rop Gadget has that for sure. Cool. Questions? Yeah, that was a lot. modern like browser based exploits you all like chain two or three different vulnerabilities together in order to actually like go from javascript to executing on your machine yeah. when you say it like leaks stuff off the stack is that just what you were talking about where it doesn't zero it out after it pops it or is that yes that's one way or uh, you could have an arbitrary read so you could have something that takes in your arguments into a buffer that says read me like negative 10 the other direction, or read me the value at uh, plus 50. So you can read, you can have out of bound reads, which aren't necessarily the same as out of bound writes. Cool. So this was something I definitely wanted to share so you could get an overview of what kind of the state of binary exploitation is. Um, so now you have buffer overflows, ROP. Um, yeah, so the area, oh, shit, I guess they're going. Okay, uh, I guess we'll stop. This is a hot. Awesome research area. A lot of stuff to do, a lot of software to uh, save. And thanks for the semester. It was really fun.